It gives me great pleasure to come here and tell you a little bit about the work that we've been doing over the last eight years on reducing the respirable challenge, um, in, in particularly in hay, but in, in forages and looking at the stable environment. And we've taken a very practical approach to this. I'm a, I'm a practical horse rider and, and owner for many years. And we wanted to look at something that the horse owners could actually do that would become part of their daily regime. And so it, this is a very practical approach to how to reduce dust in, in forage. So we know that forage is the most, um, it's a preferred for, uh, feed or hay is a preferred forage in, in, um, in the UK. Over 55% of owners feed hay. Now, some people feed haylage now, and haylage is growing in popularity, but still hay is the, is the preferred choice. And owners will say to me, well, I don't need to worry about dust in my hay because actually I've got good hay this year, and it smells sweet and it's clean. And I said, well, actually, sorry, no, you do need to worry about dust because even good quality dust, um, uh, hay has very high levels of dust. And I'm looking mainly now at the airborne respirable dust. So these are particles that are less than five microns in size. And there's a whole range of them that are potentially allergenic. Now Clark and Madeline back in 1987, so we all know this isn't a new problem, identified over 50 different microorganisms in the stable. There's a lot of literature out there saying that certain dust is allergenic and certain others isn't allergenic, and we're all finding different things. And I think this is very interesting because it actually indicates that there is many different um, varieties of allergenic respiratory disorders in horses. It's not just the fact that there's all of this dust around. We've just heard about how much dust there is in the stable environment. But it is that effect of the fact that it's, it takes so long to settle, that it stays in the air for a long time. And that means when horses are stable for a long time, and to some of them 23 hours a day maybe, and it, with every breath they can take in a very large amount of spores. So when you think that they are sit in that environment for all this time, it's little wonder that they put up respiratory diseases. So, the most important thing is to try and take this dust out of, or reduce this dust to animal interaction. So the most obvious thing is to take horses out and put them in pasture and keep them out and we'll solve our problem, we'll solve, solve a good part of our problem. But that's not practical for many, many people due to weather conditions, um, nutrition, nutritional reasons, but also for competitions, people going to competitions, stabling, etc. So great if you could do it, but we still can't, we can't just turn all the horses out. Ventilation is also key, and ventilation can indeed, if you've got a draft of greater than four meters per second of horse height, and you roughly get about five changes of air per hour, that can help tremendously. It can take a lot of the dust out. But when you think of the way some American barns are actually constructed, you have walls quite high, and the draft isn't actually taking the dust out of, the, out of that area. Added to which, most of the time the horse has his nose down and very close to the forage or close to the bedding. And unfortunately, ventilation doesn't clear dust away from the breathing zone quickly enough. So the objectives of our work is really to, to address this, looking at the allergen reduction as being the cornerstone of treatment for RAO. So we started off by looking at ways in which we can remove dust from the breathing zone by simply treating the forage. Then we've looked at how effective this is. So we've looked at the different stable management regimes and different buildings to see how much dust there is around from various different combinations of forage and bedding. Now, we have done something similar to Melissa in that we've taken a rather, a, well, a human um, dust particle measurement. And this is a little cyclone sampler. And we simply use it in the laboratory where it, 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 um, we shape the, the forage or the bedding underneath. And this um, sampler actually will um, separate the dust. So we have a filter paper in here where we get particles of less than five microns in size. And anything over that gets um, pushed into this um, to, to the pot at the bottom. And then this is why we all have students. We get them to sit for hours on end counting particles down through microscope slides. And we have various ways of counting and back counting and double counting to make sure that we get as accurate uh, an analysis of the respirable particle number as possible. So mainly when I'm talking now about airborne respirable dust, I'm talking about the dust that we have separated and that that is below five microns in size. Um, before I go on to talk about hay, I just wanted to um, say a few words about haylage because again, 
Haleage is an alternative and is becoming increasingly popular in the UK. But haleage is not dust free. And many owners again will say to me, well, I've got a dust free forage. I don't actually think there's, so, there's, a, there's such a thing. So you can still get considerable amounts of dust in haleage. And particularly now, the farmers are getting better at making haleage. And so they can make several sorts of haleage. You can get slightly wetter haleage that has a lower pH and dry matter below maybe 40% or so. And that does have very low levels of dust, but there's still dust in there. But the drier haleages, those that are 65% dry matter that have been conserved when, the, when you've got um, uh, grass heads there, that can actually be quite dusty. And indeed, surprisingly, it can contain quite high levels of pollen, uh, which, as we're seeing, uh, are potentially allergenic for the horse. The other thing about haylage is that if it's kept, the sh it has a short shelf life. And really, you start to get aerobic spoilage after three days. So if you, if, if you can only buy these sorts of large bales and you've only got one or two horses, you can't get through that in the time. And so you get quite significant buildup of Enterobacteriaceae and Listeria, which, um, which is not desirable. The other thing about hage, of course, is that it is very nutrient dense. And we certainly have a population of horses in the UK that are getting fatter and fatter. And so we, um, horses that are kept in, you want them to try and have time budgets that are as natural to that outside as, as possible. And if you're feeding very nutrient-dense forage, then they're getting fat. And if you decide to restrict that, then you're interfering with time budgets. So haylage is certainly an option. It's cer certainly something that can be considered, but it is not the answer to the problem. So in the UK, hay is still the preferred forage. It's lower energy, so people can feed more bulk in it. It has a long shelf life. It's very easy to handle. It doesn't smell. It's such you don't get told off by your husband or wife when you go into the kitchen smelling of haylage. Um, and it's very traditional, and the horse industry is very traditional. They like to feed what they know, but it is dusty. So what do we do about this? Well, there's lots of different ways, or several different ways, that you can re reduce the airborne de uh, respirable dust in hay. And the first one is soaking. Now, I did this study. It's uh, horrific to think about nearly 20 years ago now, how, how things turn around and, and bite you. But... Um, so with airborne respirable dust, you could you certain soaking will certainly reduce that by and ten minutes is what we found was the optimum for doing that. You can soak for longer, but it doesn't have any greater effect on the airborne respirable dust. And it's something that people do often. But the trouble with soaking is that it has several negatives. For a start, it leaches nutrients. We lose a lot of protein, water soluble carbohydrates, and minerals from the um, from the hay. And if you soak for extended periods, which sometimes people do for a reason to, to reduce the WSC in the hay, so that you reduce the nutrient content and you can feed it to laminitics. But you're losing all the other good stuff as well. You're losing the minerals. Sure, you could feed supplements to, to balance that, but often they're not as palatable, it's expensive, and they're not as bioavailable. Um, but when you soak hay, and it was one of the reasons actually um, in, in a seminar that I certainly thought about, about doing this, which hadn't, hadn't been measured up until then, was looking at the, uh, the post-soak effluent. It's black. It's absolutely disgusting. And in the summertime, actually, when you take hay out of there that's been soaked for more than a couple of hours, it's really very smelly. So that gives you an idea of what I'm going on to say. It increases the bacteria content of the hay significantly by two to five fold. Now, we don't, we're starting, I've got a postgraduate student working on this now, and we're starting to try and identify what these bacteria are and the extent to which they're built, uh, they're, uh, they're increasing. But I feel instinctively this is not good to actually feed a, 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 um, a forage that you've increased, you have falsely increased the bacteria content way above those that the horse would normally be exposed to. So soaking, simple, very technical process, just stick a stone on it, keep it submerged, if you soak for one and a half hours, you increase the abundances of, of the significant abundances of bacteria from dry hay. If you soak for nine hours, in fact, this is the worst time of all to soak, we get an increase in the number of pathogens. So we get things like Pseudomonas and uh, we get increases in other, other bacteria that have, um, that are implicated in respiratory disorders and some of them are implicated in, in equine, equine gastric ulceration syndrome. 
So a, lot, a longer uh, soak is not a good idea. And if we soak for 16 hours or more, those people who really want nothing left in the hay of any value at all, we get high levels of endotoxins, and we know that they are implicated in laminitis. So soaking has serious drawbacks. The other thing you could do is you can steam hay. Now, I don't know what it's like here in this beautiful city of Copenhagen, but in the UK, if anybody produces something, they think they can do it cheaper and they can do their own version. So we have lots of people producing their own steamers. And this is what I see on yards. We get these wheelie bins, they're, they're, they're council produced. I'm sure you're not supposed to do, with, do this with them. But um, what they do is they put um, a, a kettle element or a wart, a paper stripper in the bottom of it and stuff a bit of hay in it and steam it for X amount of time. The other thing that people do is that they'll take a bag and they'll put a kettle of hot, of hot water and they pour it over the hay, close the bag up and leave it sit there for X amount of time. So it's a way of steaming, but I'll tell you a little bit about the results of that in, in a minute. The other thing that you can do, of course, is you can high temperature steam. Now, these, this is one of the, obviously I'm going to talk about hay again, the specialist high temperature steamer. And the reason that this steamer is a high temperature steamer and does the job properly, evenly distributes its uh, steam through the, through the um, hay bale, is because of these spikes. And so the spikes actually push the steam up into the hay. So what about the results from all of these? How do we compare the soaking with the, the homemade steaming with the high temperature steaming? Well, this is a study that we published last year, and it was the effect of steaming and soaking on the restful particle bacteria mold and nutrient content in hay for horses. And this is just the results of the airborne respirable dust per liter of air. And you can see when you compare the soaked <coughs> with the hay gain steam, the high temperature steaming, we're getting significant reduction, equal and significant reduction of airborne respirable dust in comparison to dry hay. If you do some steaming with a kettle or with a bin steamer, just your, your hay, homemade job, you do indeed reduce respirable dust, but it is not so significantly um, different in comparison to the dry hay. So you reduce it, but it's not quite so effective. If we go on to look at the mold and bacteria content, then we've got a similar story for the hay gain, where we get this high temperature steaming causes a significant um, reduction of mold by, um, uh, down to, to five colony forming units per gram uh, and with the, with the hay gain down to 12 for the, for the bacteria. With the bin steamer, we actually do reduce the mold a little bit, but we increase the bacteria. Increase the bacteria by 200%. But if you look at the table carefully, you will see that actually we haven't got a significant difference here. Now, that, this is very interesting and is quite indicative of the process of steaming within a bin because it's such an inconsistent process. Sometimes when you steam, you get rid of lots of the dust or lots of the mold, and other times you grow more mold. When you take the steam out of a bin steamer, you have dry patches in there, areas where the steam hasn't got to, and other areas that are completely, completely saturated and are actually brown, soggy messes. So you can steam with a bin, but not only is it less effective at getting rid of the dust, but it's not a consistent process either. It's a very hit and miss process. So sometimes you might get rid of mold, and other times you might just increase bacteria hugely. All very well to say, all right, we're going to steam hay, so, but if the horses don't eat it, and that's the biggest thing of trying to get, particularly competition horses, we want to keep weight on them, keep condition on them. And um, if, if the horses won't eat the forage, then there's no good us selling hay gains. But um, in this particular study, we showed actually that the steamed hay, that horses preferred the steamed hay significantly more than they did the dry hay, and they preferred to eat dry hay in comparison to soaked hay. Now that's not surprising when you think of what the soaked hay can be like when it's very wet and, and, uh, and rather smelly. This study was also backed up by one that was done in, in Riddle College by, by Brown, and they actually compared it with haylage. And they found that steamed hay was, was not only did they eat more steamed hay, but it was the one that was most prepared on choice when they were given a choice. So they went to eat that more frequently. In terms of the nutrient content, what does steaming do to the nutrients in, in, in the forage? 
And as primarily a nutritionist, um, the, I'm always concerned that, that people see their forage as something that makes a valuable contribution to the diet, that, that animals can actually eat forage and not have to have so much concentrates. So the only <coughs> nutrient that we actually reduce and leach out are water-soluble carbohydrates. Sometimes this loss can be quite low, can be down at about only 2% of the WSC present, and other times it can be quite high at 54%. So again, I have a, have a, a student look, looking into this and looking at the variability and what it is that makes some hays lose more water-soluble carbohydrates when they're, when they're steamed, or, uh, and some others that, that lose less. And at the moment, we're not seeing any correlation between WSC content or indeed stage of growth. So there's, there's something else going on there. We're, going, we're looking at, at surveying lots of hays and seeing what's going on here. Incidentally, if people say that they want to soak hay to reduce water-soluble carbohydrates, soaking hay is just as variable. You get rid of either the range is from 9% up to about 57%. So none of these processes are, are guaranteed. But other than losing small amounts of WSC, all the other nutrients are conserved in steamed hay. So you're not actually losing any of the valuable minerals, and more importantly, we're not losing any of the protein. And some of that protein associated with the fiber that goes, goes through to the hindgut is very good for promoting good, healthy microbiome. And again, that's very important. So why do the hay gain steamers work? Well, it's to do with the way they are designed and what, what they do. All of them, whether it's one of the, the, the big two, um, uh, hay steamers that you'll see next door, or this, this 600, or the single um, hay steamers here, they all have got this spiked manifold in here. And the spiked manifold actually pushes the steam right up into the center of the bale and permeates all the steam. Now we've done lots and lots and lots of measurements of this, looking at how, what temperature that we're, we're getting there. And when you open the box, you get massive amounts of steam coming out, so you know that the steam has been trapped in there, and the hay is evenly steamed. The real key to this process is the temperature. You need to get above 90 degrees C for 10 minutes to kill all the mold. And if you steam properly, you have to follow the instructions. You have to do what it says you are to do. You've got to steam, and you've got to make sure that you get into the green zone for more than 10 minutes. If you do that, you will kill the mold, all the mold, and you will kill virtually all the bacteria. So it's the high temperature part of this process that is the most effective, and the fact that the steam is evenly distributed through the bale. Reducing this airborne respirable dust also goes on for some time. Now, we haven't extended it more than 24 hours, but what this is one of the early studies we looked at, thinking, well, if you steam hay, can you then take some with you in the horse box, or can you leave it to, the, to one side? And does, it, do, does the steam become um, airborne again? Does the dust become airborne again? How effective is the steam? So 24 hours after steaming, and this was just a bale that was taken out of the steamer, some was fed, and it was just left there outside the stable door. And we still had 80% reduction in airborne respirable dust. So once you reduce the dust inside the hay, that's it. It doesn't come back again. So the slight increase in dust is due to some of the dust within the stable environment settling down on the outside of the bale. So it's effective certainly for 24 hours, and we need to measure it for a little bit longer. Um, so those were just studies that, were, that we did looking at. We, so we took samples of hay, we took them into a clean environment, and we shook them, and we measured the airborne respirable dust, we measured the bacteria and, and the fungi levels. But what happens actually in the field? How does this process work either when traveling horses or when we're looking at them in the stable? And here we just did a study. This is fairly recently done by, by one of my undergraduate students. And we put the cyclone sampler here when the horses were traveling. And they traveled with dry hay and soaked hay, and, uh, et cetera. And here are the results that we got from, um, from this study. Again, equal reduction in terms of significant reduction of airborne respirable dust when either you steam hay or you soak hay, but steaming hay is a little bit more effective. Um, surprisingly, actually, that the levels of dust were as low as they were when, when, when traveling. And that's because, again, it, in fact, it's a good demonstration of ventilation. All the, all the, the windows were open 
and as the lorry was, was being driven, there's a good flow of air through. So it's taking some of the dust away from the, um, from the animal. But this is still the, the cyclone sample was right by the horse's breathing zone, right by his nose. So you still know that this is what the horse is being exposed to. So very useful to know that if you steam hay, and also if you steam hay, you don't have that water dripping all over everything else in the, in the bottom of uh, um, the lorry. We also did, I, we, we didn't get nine, no, uh, was it, how many, was it 10 million samples? We didn't quite do 10 million samples, but we also rigged up our, um, our cyclone sampler on the horse because we wanted to measure what the horse was getting um, exposed to when it was walking around in the stable and indeed being um, exposed to hay in the, in the breeding zone, in the stable zone. And so this is, is the, one of the latest studies that we looked at, and we looked at four different management regimes, and we actually looked at them both in two different stable, uh, stable designs. So we had American barns, and we also had single block stables, which are quite popular in the UK. And we had different variations. We had shavings and steamed hay, then we had shavings and dry hay, straw and haylage, and straw and dry hay. And this is just the first general analysis looking at across both stable types, both the stable zone and the breathing zone, and just looking at how overall management regime, uh, what sort of impact it had on the airborne respirable dust. So this is, the, this is a log transform data here, and these are the actual particles. And you can see that we had significantly less airborne respirable dust with the shavings and steamed hay regime in comparison to the shavings and dry hay, followed by the straw and haylage, and last of all, as expected, the straw and the dry hay. So uh, perhaps some people might find different results in, with, with some of the, um, with, with looking at sub, sub, certain types of shavings and dry hay, but this, these were the particular um, samples that we found. Looking now, and I thought this was particularly interesting and actually demonstrated what it is that you, where you need to take the dust, why you need to remove the dust in certain areas from the horse. So with the steam, the steam hay and shavings right across the board in individual stables and in American barns, we we significantly dropped the airborne respirable dust. And there wasn't significantly more airborne respirable dust either in the general stable zone or in the breathing zone um, of the horse. However, when we go to dry hay and shavings, not surprisingly, in both American barn and individual stables, we had significantly more dust in the breathing zone uh, of both of these, and more dust actually in the American barn system than we did in the individual stables. When we reverse it, when we feed a low dust forage, then we have, um, we, and, and straw, you find that you get a higher levels of airborne respirable dust in the general stable environment in comparison to the breathing zone, and the same in the individual stables. Now these, these differences in numbers here would reflect the airspace and the movement of air around, around the building. So actually having straw in a single stable, in a 12 by 14 um, stable, is not a great idea because your horse is exposed to an awful lot of dust in the general environment. If, however, you, you do go to the regime of dry hay and straw, and I don't think anybody would recommend that, that you do that now, but it is interesting to see what the figures look like. Very high levels in the American barn, both in the, um, in the stable zone and the breathing zone. And they are higher in comparison to individual stables. And this shows that we're getting significant sharing of dust within an American barn system. It also could reflect the fact that you've got more horses moving around and kicking up on the straw and shaking hay nets and, and etc. And so most definitely within a big single airspace, dry hay and straw is not a regime that can be recommended. Many years ago, I was living in Wales and it was very, it's very wet in West Wales, very difficult to make good hay. So I used to, be, used to feed haylage but I only had two horses and I couldn't actually use all the haylage in the given time. So I thought, well, what happens actually if we steam haylage? And interestingly, we get just as good results steaming haylage as we do hay. So we get a significant reduction of fungi and, and bacteria when we steam. And that reduction in bacteria and, and fungi lasts up, up to four days. So even four days after steaming, the haylage is cleaner in terms of, of fungi and, and bacteria content than, than in a freshly opened bale. So you can also steam haylage and indeed 
Christine Foley, which is very palatable. This is not something that I necessarily recommend people do, because if I say, right, you all have to go off and, and uh, steam your straw as well, everybody would scream at me, because you'd spend all your life steaming. <laughs> but, but, just say you have a very precious mare, or uh, you want to foam her down on straw, or um, you have a horse, and for whatever reason, and we have a few people in the UK who like to keep their adventures on straw, you can steam straw, and it is quite effective in doing so. So we have found that we get reduction in airborne respirable dust um, uh, in steam straw, and again, that, that reduction in airborne respirable dust in the straw does last, once you've steamed it, it lasts up to seven days. Um, the steaming is more effective than putting, um, than putting a disinfectant on the straw as well. So as I say, it's not something that I necessarily suggest that everybody rushes off and starts to bed down straw, but steam it all first. But it is an option. There is something that you can do that if you wish to do it. So in conclusion, soaking hay. Soaking is effective at reducing airborne respirable dust. There's no doubt about that. But it does compromise the nutrient and hygienic quality of the forage. So I don't really recommend you do that. You can steam in a homemade steamer, by all means. But if you steam in a bag or a bin, you get partial reduction of airborne respirable dust. And as I said, it's very inconsistent and very patchy, but it does significantly compromise the hygienic quality of the forage. And not so long ago, I, went to, I, gave, I gave a talk in the UK to, to oh, one of the veterinary CPD evenings. And one of the vets was saying to me, they go onto yards and they pull this, the, the um, hay out of the steamer and the smell is disgusting. And he said it's actually acting as an incubator unit, and that is exactly what it's doing, particularly in the summertime. So you get it up to a nice temperature, and you put you put a nice organic matter in there, and not surprisingly, the bacteria go, yay, great, and they all breed, and we've got masses of, of uh, increase. So that is not a process that I would, would recommend either. So high temperature steaming seems to be one of the ways forward. <laughs> If you steam high temperature in the hay gain steamer, it consistently reduces the airborne respirable dust by 99% and the mold and bacteria by 95%. The hay that comes out of there and the haylage is palatable. It hasn't lost many nutrients, so it's conserved the nutrients, and you can also use it to extend the shelf life of haylage. So that is something I do recommend. I would just like to, to uh, finish off with a couple of thoughts here, is that a couple of our learned colleagues have made these comments, and they're, they're things that I, I would subscribe to. Environmental management is the most important factor in the treatment of horses with RAO, and I think that, that is absolutely the case. Let's not, let's not introduce the problem, and let's take the dust away from them before we start giving them drugs and trying to treat an allergy that once they've got, they've got for life. We suggest that veterinarians place more emphasis on the importance of stable air quality and respiratory system health when working with their clients. And again, I couldn't disagree with that. I would like to acknowledge the, the years of help from ProPress Equine and uh, Haygain Steamers and all the students that have worked on, on these various different projects and stood for hours in stables collecting dust samples and indeed spent many hours in the stable. Uh, in, the, in the lab um, counting particles. Before I finish, I would just like to dedicate this talk. I would like to dedicate this talk to Brian Fillery, who sadly passed away last August. Brian was the inventor of Haygain, and he and his partner Tim Oliver came to me just over nine years ago with an idea and a box with spikes in it. And we worked at it and developed it and tested it and finally produced the Haygain. And his work and his, his idea has contributed to improving the respiratory health of horses throughout the world. He was a great person with students. He was very enthusiastic. He was very keen to pass his message on. And he was always smiling. And I was very privileged to work with him for eight years. Thank you very much.